I'm not Brian. I'm Aaron. I'm one of the pastors here at Cornerstone. Uh, I'm excited to be able to share with you uh, about a passage that's just been, actually, um, that I've been obsessing about and has captivated me for quite some time. We're in this series in the Gospel of Matthew, um, looking at our Father, our King, Avinu Malkenu, and we've gone through a variety of different things. Last week, Brian talked about the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. Before that, Gene was talking about Jesus completing the trial and the testing in, uh, in the desert. And now we're going to jump forward a bunch of chapters, and we're going to move into chapter 20 today. So if you have your Bible, we're in the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to read chapter 20 and... Uh, it's the parable of the labors in the vineyard. So I'm going to dive right in. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarii a day, he sent them into the vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? Things that my wife has said to me. Back to the scriptures, let's get spiritual. They said to him, because no one has hired us, he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarii. When those, hired came, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarii. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, and saying, the last worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day in the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarii? Take what belongs to you and go. I chose to give the last worker as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I invite you in this place. And I ask through your word and through the stories of Jesus that you will teach us how to live with the currency of the kingdom. That our eyes will be opened to the way you are. And may it be on earth as it is in heaven. Please help me to get out of the way and simply be a messenger. I praise you for who you are and all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. So Jesus gives this teaching. He's had a barrage of questions. He's just had a rich man come up to him and say, what good thing do I need to do to get into heaven? And Jesus asks him, has he been following the law? And then he ups the ante and he says, sell everything you have. And the man says, son of a gun. And he goes away. Some of the religious teachers at the time, they're looking at the favor of Jesus. They're like, hmm, this guy's pretty bright. He's pretty brilliant. Let's give him a hard one. And they begin to try to trick him with some of the questions about divorce and some of these other things. Jesus has gone through this, and finally he stops it and he says, almost as if to say, I want to lift your eyes from a moment from the little details. And I want everybody all together to take a big step back. And I want to tell you, what heaven's like. And not only do I want to tell you what heaven is like, but I want to let you know that the principles and the values of heaven are beginning and continue to invade this earth. And it's not about can you do this, can you not do this, how much of this, how much of that. But then he begins to tell a parable of this is what heaven is like. It's like a man who is the master of the house, and he leaves his house early in the morning, and the master of the house who is caring for the vineyard, it's time for the, 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 the grapes to be harvested, and the window of opportunity is narrow, and he goes out into the marketplace, and he finds some day laborers. 
and there are the day laborers, and they're standing there, and they're ready to work for the day, and he negotiates a price with them early in the morning, and then he sends them in. He says, all right, a denarii a day, I'll take that, and he sends them off into his vineyard. And then he's milling around, watching the workers, and he decides, I'm going back into the marketplace. So the master of the house goes back into the marketplace. He was there at 6 a.m., and now he's going back at 9, and he sees some people there, and he says, go into the vineyard, and I'll give you what is right. Three hours later, 12, he goes back. Three hours later after that, he goes back. Three in the afternoon, and to each one, he sees them, and he sends them into the vineyard, and he says, I'll give you what is right. And then the day is going on, and quitting time is about 6 o'clock, when the whistle will blow and everybody will be done for the day and the master of the house goes into the marketplace at five and there, and I love what it says, and he finds people. And he finds this group of men who are standing there and he asks them a question of, what are you doing? Why are you guys standing around idle? They said, we've been here all day. No one's hired us. And he looks at them and he says, you go too. And he sends them off into the vineyard. Well, it's quitting time, and the master of the house says to the foreman, foreman, get out your money bag. It's time to pay these good men. Let's give them their wages. But let's do it a little different today. All right, sir. How about you have the last ones go first? And the last ones march up to get what they think could be a fair wage. Imagine their surprise when he drops in his, their hands a denarii. Whoa! Whoa! I was here an hour. This is a great wage. The next group comes up. They've been there longer. They're like, I'm going to get some more cash. It's going to be payday. And he gives them a denarii. Goes through each one of the groups. And the guys that were there since early morning, they've been there for a full day's work in the heat of the day. And they think, surely we're going to get more than everyone else. And he puts in their hand a denarii. And they're upset. What's the deal with this? That's not fair. And the master of the house says, wait a minute, you and, we negotiated early this morning and you said you would give a day's work for this amount and I paid you what you're due. And I love the fact he calls him friend. Friend. And then he says to them, are you upset because I'm generous? I'll do whatever I want with my money. <laughs> Take your money and go. And the last will be first and the first will be last. And one of the things that's happening in this passage is, just like with the brilliance of all the Gospels, there's a simple story, but as we sit with it more and more, many different colors and sounds and seams begin to come out. And we see that there's a complexity that is going on in this story, because it's not just a story about laborers and a master of the house and a vineyard. What Jesus is doing, he's saying, I'm wanting to show you what heaven is like. I'm wanting to show you a new economy that is not dollars and denarii, but it is one that has a different type of currency. And Jesus, through this story, is showing a different type of currency that our Father, our King, operates with. And it isn't monetary. Wendell Berry, who is a philosopher, writer, poet, farmer, (laughs) he says this, He says the the kingdom of God or the great economy is practically an economy. It includes principles and patterns by which values or powers or necessities are parceled out and exchanged. And so in a real fancy way is what he's saying is the kingdom of God is, is the great economy. But it doesn't operate on a currency of denarii or drachma, or dollars, or Bitcoin, or whatever you want it to. But it operates in a different type of currency. And what I'd like to do is to spend the next few moments pulling out of this passage four different things that I see are the currency of the great economy of God. And the currency that are parceled out and that are negotiated on and the principles and the values in which we live with As Jesus says, the time has come when the kingdom of God is now here. That we no longer look and have our heads down to what should I do or what should I not do. But we take a step back and say, what is the great economy? What is the kingdom of God like? 
and how does it operate, and what are those principles? Does that sound okay for the next few moments for us to do? Everybody okay? Anybody need popcorn, a drink? Are we okay? All right. There will be no in-flight movie on this, on this little ex escapade. The first thing that we see here is right off the bat, Jesus is flipping things on their end and flipping the economy and the social structure upside down by saying, the kingdom of heaven is like the master of the house who goes out. Because we already see that the master of the house had a foreman who would be dealing with the workers. Says it at the end. But this master of the house goes out himself. He leaves his home, he leaves the hacienda on the hill with the vineyard that's beautiful and wonderful, and he goes into the marketplace, and he gets involved in the lives of the people. And so the currency of the kingdom of God is relational. It is personal. The master of the house interacts personally and uniquely with each of the laborers. In the kingdom of God, in the great economy, there is no one size fits all. It's custom. See, he goes out to the first rounders, gathers them, and he says, so what are we going to do today? How much is it going to cost? A denarii? Sounds about good. And he talks to them, sends them out into his vineyard. Then when he goes out at 9, 12, and 3, he sees them uniquely. He speaks to them and says, you go too, and I'll give you what is right. He has a unique interaction with those individuals that's different than the first one. Then, finally, when he goes out at 5 o'clock, it's different from the others as well. It is not a one-size-fits-all. He goes and he finds them. Now, I like, to, I like to kind of put myself in the story and play with the idea a little bit, so forgive me. But when he says finds them, I wonder if he was rounding them up. These individuals that were left, these individuals that are just kind of hanging out loitering, so to speak. And he gathers them up and he says, what are you guys doing here? And he has a conversation with the day workers. This is a person who is the master of the house, who owns a vineyard and has what he, need, what he can provide for himself. And he has a simple conversation with these day workers and says, what is it? What are you doing? Tell me your story. He gets involved in the mess of the marketplace. He doesn't just stand back and go, I'm going to put up a billboard late at night and you can read it. Meet me at my house in the morning. But he leaves his place and he goes into the marketplace and he personally interacts with each one of the day workers. So the currency of the great empire, the currency, not empire, sorry, that's a different thing. That's a different sermon. Strike that from the video, the great economy. <laughs> the currency of the great economy, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is relational. It is personal. It is unique with the individual. And we see this not only in the parable of the laborers, but we see it in the very beginning because God speaks and there is light and there's life and he gives them a job and he gives them a purpose. And then what's he do? Does he set it all in motion and say, peace, see you at the end? No. He comes down in the cool of the day and he walks with them and he talks to them and he has conversations. And even when they sin, he asks them a question. It is personal. The beauty of this is in all of Jesus' other parables, the prodigal son and in other places, the, the story of the talents. You also see it in the story of Jonah. Everyone... When the prodigal son comes home, the elder brother is upset, right? Hey, he squandered all the wealth. What does the father say to the son, the elder brother? You've been with me the whole time. There's a relational quotient to say, that's the currency I look at. We've been together. Not just about the money that has been squandered or what you'll get later. So the kingdom of God, the currency is personal. He was like that in the garden, walking with them. Then with Abram, Abram doesn't have a great future. I mean, there is not a great future for Abram and Sarai. They're like, well, we're foreigners in a foreign land. We can't have any kids. What does God do? Comes into the marketplace and the mess of their lives and changes it forever. What's he do with Moses? A, a, a murderer who has a really issue of like, where do I belong? 
am I Egyptian? Am I Israelite? Now I'm with the Midianites. I'm with tons of women, and this is good and bad in the same sentence. Thank you, Jethro. And what, is, what does God do? Gets in the mess and the marketplace of his life, and that there's a different currency. He does the same with David. He does the same through Jesus. He does it with his spirit. He does it through all history. And I'm sure if we had time to go through this room today, that the currency of the great economy, the kingdom of God, is that the master gets involved in our mess and in the marketplace right where we are at. And it's custom to our lives. But he doesn't stop there. The next thing we see is that the great economy, the kingdom of heaven, is compassionate. Now for us to understand this, and you probably know way more than this, we have to understand the plight of the day worker. This is an individual that does not have job security. There is no 401k. There is no Kaiser health plan. There is no deductible. There is no HSA. There's none of that. There is the fact that I will get up in the morning, and if I get hired, and that person is faithful to pay me, I will have enough money to provide food for my family. There is a desperation in the day worker because they are one day, many times, from starvation, and they are living on the precipice of poverty because they are desperate. I need to work that day. If I do not work, I do not eat. Some of us can remember back before all the club sports and the organized sports when at the end of the day you would go home, throw your backpack down, and then everybody would line up, whether it was the basketball court, the soccer field, the baseball diamond, and two of the best and the brightest would choose teams does anybody remember what that was like? Remember not being chosen? So I was a bit of a late bloomer. I went into high school at five foot two, 89 pounds with these ears, which should be on a 6'10 man, and size 13 feet. I look like Mars the Martian. But I could bomb from deep. That's all I have to say, just kidding. I was not chosen first. It wasn't like, ooh, that's one we want. The strange looking mouse kind of person. <laughs> and I remember that feeling of not being chosen. Now, mine was, it was a bit of dignity of like, I want to be on the team. There was nothing on the line. There was no starvation. The de I would go home, have whatever snacks, and the day would begin. But apply that to the day worker throughout human history and that it happens right now as we speak, that there are individuals that gather early in the morning with the desperation of I hope and pray that I am chosen today to work so that I have enough to provide food for my family at the night. And not only is that desperation to have the finances, but just how work gives a sense of dignity to a man and a woman the person is living and saying, I hope I'm chosen so that I can have some dignity. So that when I go home, my kids go, Dad, Mom, you provided for us instead of having another day where I say I, I wasn't picked. That's the day worker. That's the plight of the person that the master of the house is going to. And he goes to the first rounders, and they negotiate a wage. But then he goes back, and I wonder why, and the story doesn't tell us why. It doesn't tell us that there was more work. You know, the King James doesn't, if there was more worketh for thyeth people, and soeth the master oveth went back into it. It doesn't tell us that there wasn't. It leaves it vague. But for some reason, the master of the house leaves his vineyard and what is going on, and he goes back one, two, three, four more times. And to the, and to the second group, the group that came at nine, 12, and three, these are most likely the unneeded workers, aren't they? You know what? Job's been filled. You're unneeded. And so, the master of the house, just like the kingdom of heaven, goes to the unneeded worker and says, I'll pay you what's right. Head out there. Could you imagine the elation of the person at 9, 12, and 3 when they're going, I thought it was done. I thought the day was ruined. And I was going to have to face the fact that I have no, that my dignity is less and my desperation is higher. I got chosen today, and I'm going in. The master of the house chooses the ones, the first rounders. He chooses the unneeded, and then he even goes back at five, where there's only an hour left, 
And who's left at that hour? It's not the unneeded. It's the unwanted. These are the ones that no one wanted. Maybe they're elderly. Maybe they're weak. Maybe they're foreigner. Maybe they're those kind of people. Maybe they have a reputation for something, and no one wants to be around them. And so they are left all day. And he goes to the unwanted ones, and he says, I found you. I found you all. What are you doing here? And that word idle in the Greek, argos, it it can mean lazy or nothing to do, but it also can mean without work, unemployed, which isn't always the plight and caused by laziness. There are many factors of that. But these are the ones that are unwanted. And the master of the house says, I want you guys. Head on out. I love the fact he doesn't promise a wage. They're so stoked to be chosen, there's no negotiating a wage. He doesn't say a denarii. He doesn't say, I promise you something. He's just like, thank you. I don't have to stand anymore. And whether they wheeled themselves there, carried themselves there, crawled themselves there, ran themselves there, they went into the vineyard and they were chosen without a promise of of any compensation. But their dignity was lifted. And the kingdom of God, the great economy, is personal. And it is compassionate. And that compassion meets the desperation of people and it provides for them in their most desperate place. But it also offers dignity. The master of the house brought dignity to those people for that day. And he didn't stop there. We see that God has done this through the, throughout the Bible. We see he offered dignity to Abraham who didn't, wasn't going to have it. Moses who wasn't going to have it. David who wasn't going to have it. Countless individuals that are not the suspects anybody wanted to choose. And God goes, I like my odds with you. I choose you. But I'm the weakest from the weakest tribe. And I'm by myself and there's not enough people. Yeah, Gideon, you're the one I want. But I stutter. Yeah, you're the one I want. But I'm small and Rudy, and I don't even know what Rudy means. David, you're the one I want. And he goes through this. But I'm a fisherman. Peter, you're the one I want. Paul, I've been opposed to you, but you're the one I want. But he doesn't stop there. The great economy, the kingdom of heaven, is personal. It is compassionate. And it's absolutely faithful. Because one of the things with these day workers is they are not only at the mercy of being chosen, they're at the mercy that the person that chose them will do what they said they're going to do. There's a story uh, I read recently. I think it happened in 2010. But there was a band, and the band named themselves the Day Workers of the North. And they wrote a hit song called, That Guy Don't Pay. And it started as a little thing in their community to let people know, hey, if you take a job, day workers, from that guy, he's not going to pay. And so what he's going to do is he's going to trick you to come work for him, and at the end of the day, he's going to threaten you. And it actually happened that there was a man who was selected by an individual, came, picked him up at a place, took him. The man worked 10 hours of the day, and at the end of the day, you know what he did? Told the authorities that that man tried to rob him and he was thrown in jail. So not only did he steal his provision, he stole his dignity. And he lorded it over him because many times the day workers don't have documentation. And there's a story that goes with it. And they're at complete risk. And many times in the currency of our world is to take advantage of those. But in the currency of the great economy, the kingdom of God, he fulfills what he promises he keeps his promise. Now, sometimes it's longer than we'd like. would be like, you promised. He said, I didn't forget. Israel, 420 years in slavery. He didn't forget. He kept his promise. But it took his time. But we see this throughout the scriptures, that the master of the house, the economy of the kingdom of heaven is one of faithfulness, that God does what he promises he's going to do. When, Adam, when, this, when there is, in the beginning, there is the sin, and God is handing out the punishment to Adam and Eve, he stops for a second, and there's what theologians call the proto-evangelium, which is a big fancy word that makes them feel good about themselves, to say there's a good news. And it says he will crush the head of the serpent, 
and he will bruise his heel. But what's happening is he's promising to say, yeah, you may have messed this up. I'm going to fix it. And then we see all the places where he said, I promise you, Abraham and Sarah, you're going to have a kid. And what happens? They have that. I promise you, Israel, I will deliver you. I promise you I will send you the Messiah. I promise you I will pour out my spirit. I promise you I will do these things. I will return you from captivity. And what does he do? He is faithful to keep his promises. Praise God. And so we see that in this story, at the beginning, 6 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the evening, when the master comes back, he's fulfilling his promises. And guess what? For some people, the promises are better than they imagined. And some people, they are what they imagined. And that's good, too, because he fulfills his promises. The last thing that we see, we see personal, we see compassionate, we see that he is faithful. And the last thing is the currency of the great economy, the kingdom of heaven, is built on generosity. You know, as I've sat with this story and looked at it a thousand different times over the last couple weeks, why did he have the, first, the last workers go first at the end? Imagine he leans over to the form, he's like, watch this. Watch what's going to happen here. It's going to get crazy. <laughs> And he has those first workers. And one of the things that I believe it was for dignity. He parades those first workers that worked for an hour in front of everyone. To, and then when he handed the coin, there was provision and dignity restored to the unwanted. And he gives it to them and says, here you go. Imagine those individuals grabbing those coin to go, are you serious? This is amazing. I don't deserve this. And he's like, you don't. It's going to take me a while to fix what you just worked on. <laughs> That, if I was one of the workers, that what he would have done is like, Foreman, have him be a supervisor. <laughs> you can't be trusted with any tools. But those workers, they receive that denarii, and they're elated because they get to go home to their families and say, I did it. And I provided for them, and there is this dignity that happens. And there is generosity. And he goes down the line, and the other ones are going, I'm going to get more. And they're like, we didn't get more. <laughs> The ones at six, or uh, the ones that, that came in at three, are like, I bet I'll get a uh, denarii and no. Well, I could be upset, but I didn't work that long either. Thank you. And then the ones at 12, well, I worked a half a day. Thank you. I'm not going to get in. And, and the ones that came at nine. But the ones that were there in the very beginning, they're a little bit upset, aren't they? They're looking and going, I worked all day for you in the heat I've carried my weight in this, and you're going to give me what I deserve? And then I imagine the master house like, can you say that back to yourself? <laughs> you're going to give me what I, but you didn't give them what they deserve. You're right. I'm being just to you. I'm being gracious to them. Because the generosity and the currency of generosity equals the playing field. All of a sudden, the ones that are the first rounders and the ones that are the last are equal. And they're both receiving a coin. Their dignity has been raised and provision has been raised. But at the same time, the generosity of God has an amazing way of boring a hole and exposing our insecurities, doesn't it? Because those workers go, you're saying that I'm equal to them? To those guys? The last and the least? And then the master of the house steps in and says, friend, this day worker he just met, he calls him friend. Friend, I've done you no wrong. Are you upset because I'm generous? Why don't you go away? Take what's yours and leave. But what happens with the generosity and the currency, the currency of generosity is when, this is me, none of you are like this. When I am in want, need, lack, or in the wrong, and there is grace and generosity to give me, oh, praise God, glory on high. Praise him on, you know, a tambourine, on a trampoline. Just praise him. Thank you for all he does. But when I've done something and someone else gets more than me and I've earned it, I don't like it. Do you not know who I am? Do you not know how many years I've done this? Do you not know the experience that I have and you're going to give them that? Well, that's not fair. 
The economy of God does not work in fairness. It works in favor. It works in favor. And favor has to do with relationship, compassion, faithfulness, and generosity. And he gets in the mess of people's lives and says, I will give favor to you for that which you do not deserve to provide for you. On a custom, unique basis. But it doesn't work in fairness. Because if it works in fairness, it's, it's kind of lousy. So my grandmother, she passed away in, in, in December, uh, in, in, uh, in, in October. And she was an amazing woman. But one of the things is she was like, fairness was, she was like the queen of fairness. And when it came to Christmas, she had it down to the penny that everybody got the exact amount of gift. Now, luckily, I was a different gender than the other grandchildren because all the girls got the same thing, different color, whether you wanted it or not. Addie's getting pink, Kayla's getting yellow, Shaylin's getting green, Grace is getting purple. It didn't matter what it was, but that color was chosen for you on high from the beginning of time, and it was spoken into being, and you will have that for the rest of your life. And it will look like something Grandma liked, flowery, ornate. And so some of the girls are like, oh, thank you, I love this. And then one of the girls, Grace, is like, just looks at me ter- like, I hate everything is happening right now. <laughs> and so, but it was fair. It was always fair. Everything was fair. And Addie loved it because Addie got two because Grace was like, I don't want this. <laughs> <laughs> so Addie's my other daughter who would get two dresses, a pink one and a purple one. But one of the things is, is in looking at that to go, you know what, that is fair. And that's a way to do something. But there's no relationship in there. There's no compassion in there. There's not being known. And I know my grandmother's heart was to be kind, and we would always be like, say, say thank you to grandma and smile, and we'll take it back. <laughs> Please give the receipts, grandma. They grow so fast. You know how it is, kids these days. But one of the things is that God does not operate in that such a way that there is one size fits all, and his currency isn't this piece of where he just gives it out and says, this is fair. If you do this, you get this. If you don't do this, you don't get this. Because he operates in favor. The favor on an individual basis. And it's between him and us. And this currency is one that is so, isn't it so drastically different from the culture we live in? That it's personal, not virtual. It's compassionate and not competitive. It is faithful and not, I hope I can get as much as I can out of you. And finally, it is generous. And in that generosity, he continues to grant unmerited favor for his glory and our good. But it does not look the same for all of us. As I land this plane, and as I finish up here, I think this is an incredible, beautiful story that I've scratched the surface on, and I hope you take some time to read more about the master of the house and the day laborers and the vineyard and his generosity. But there's something in this that absolutely, in my opinion, blocks, erodes, and destroys the currency of the kingdom of heaven. And it blocks us from living in the great economy, and that's comparison. We see it at the end of the story. We see at the end of the story, these individuals who are not looking at the master of the house, but they're looking at the ones who got more than they think they should have. And what's happened is no longer are they looking relationally. Even when the master says, friend, the guy doesn't want anything to do with him and says, I don't want anything to do with you. No longer can they remember the desperation of the morning to say, I hope I get hired. No longer do they realize the faithfulness of, wow, this is a day when he said he'd do this and he did do this. But they're looking and grudging and complaining because you were nicer and more generous to that person than to me. And you allowed them to advance and me not to advance. And all of that is rooted in comparison. And what comparison does for us, just like it does for them, is it will block us from relationship with God. When we are looking around at the people around us and comparing our 
financial status, our relational status, the circumstances and the situations, our possessions, all of those things. When we're looking around, it blocks us not only from them, but from God. It blocks us also from receiving the compassion in which God looks at us with. And instead of that, it erodes our sense of dignity. It stops us from looking to see that, God, you've been so faithful to me. Though there's been rough spots and things have happened, you've been faithful. But it blocks us from that. And finally, it cuts us off from the generosity of God. Because we're constantly looking and saying, how can it be that you would do that for them, but this is happening in my life? And it causes us to live in, in a poverty of the kingdom, not in the abundance of the kingdom. Does that make sense? I, you know, one of the things for me is, and I have to do it because of some of the arenas I'm in, but social media for me is so difficult because it's, it's just comparison. It shouldn't be Instagram. It should be Envygram. Because everybody looks like they're richer, prettier, more famous, and doing better things than me. And I look at it, and I just begin to go, ugh. And I begin to forget about the, relation, the things that God has done in my life, and the opportunities that I have, and the relationships that I have, and the compassion in which he looks on me, and the generosity that he has bestowed upon me and my family. But I'm looking at the other person. And it begins to cut me off from him, and it begins to cut me off from them. I'm going to ask the band to come back up, and we're kind of around this, bring this down. Am I alone in comparing? Does anybody else struggle with that? <laughs> it is something that we spend much of our days in the employment line looking at what the people in front of us got and hoping we get more than them so that we feel better about ourselves. But that comparison then breeds to living a life of competition. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just spend a little bit of time for us to say, Lord, will you begin to not only invite us, but will you empower us to live from the currency of the kingdom? that I'll move from dollars and denarii and drachma and whatever it may be, and I will begin to look at the currency of relationship. And I will look at the currency of compassion. And I will look at the currency of faithfulness. And I will look at the currency of generosity. Will you pray with me? I'd like to take a little risk here and with your eyes closed. Let's place ourselves in that story. Let's imagine all of us right now are at the end of the day. And we're all in that line. Lined up. To meet the master of the house and the foreman. What I'd love right now is that through the Spirit of God, He will allow you to feel or think or sense and to be aware of the fact that He enters into the mess of your life, your specific life. He enters into the mess and the marketplace of your life. Right where you're at. say I choose you but you know yeah I still choose you and as you're there in that line 
you experience the compassion that he has upon you. And that your faith and trust begins to rise up to say, I can trust that he's going to do what he said he's going to do. And then finally, you begin to have this confidence. offering you abundant life, unmerited favor, more than you deserve. Some of you, I just invite you to stay in that place. But for others, if you're in this place today and say, you know what, I see that there is a real problem with comparison in my life and it's causing problems. I just want you to open up your hand. I want to pray a blessing that the Lord will meet you right there. And that the Lord will begin to meet you in the place that you're at. Holy Spirit, you see my friends, you see myself here. I pray that right now, it needs to be that they see this in their spirit and mind or they just need to hear it that it's almost as if you're taking their their face that's looking around at everyone else and you're gently but firmly moving it back to your face and as they catch eyes with you they see your eyes of love your eyes of fire and the desire to look at others is fading away they catch a glimpse of you, that the floodgates of relationship, compassion, faithfulness, and generosity begin to flow into every fiber of their being. I pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Messiah, and I pray that they will go down deep into fertile soil and grow up and bear fruit.